Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. That is the last day of the Turkish Wind Energy Conference, and that is the afternoon session. I actually uh, sound better, uh, but I'm uh, a bit having cold, so uh, that's how I will address to you. We'll be discussing a topic that has never been discussed in the previous TVEX, but also in the other congresses as well. I have four uh, very distinguished speakers with me. And for the wind power plants that are operational today, once the incentives are over, what their future will be, what type of a market they should be expecting. That's what we'll be discussing in this panel. As you all know, in Turkey, there is a low number, 53.46. There is a uh, 7.3 uh, dollar cent kilowatt hour of an incentive that lasts for 10 years and ma many of the power plants already use it in these 10 years and uh, they are one by one becoming um they're one by one decommissioned i mean what i mean is that they are no more uh, going to be using these incentives it is these are the wind power plants uh, that we use the feed-in tariff and about to be finished uh, will increase in number and in the upcoming five to six years 4,000 megawatts will be the capacity that we will reach. Therefore, um, what we should expect? I have four speakers. Thank you very much for joining us. From REST Group, in Estatbak, from the London office, senior financial and commercial analyst, Jem Ashok, from the Electricity Generators Society, head of the executive committee, Jem Ashok, Emre Hatem, from Garanti BBVA, uh, from Corporate Finances and Project Finance, Senior Vice President, and lastly, Juan Jose Diaz Gonzalez, from the NVGL Germany, from Bonn office. He's a senior energy consultant. Now, I will divide the topic in two, I mean, the entire panel. The first thing is that how we actually started the journey for wind, what were the expectations, what happened, and what is the situation now, and what we should be expecting from now on. Let's have a discussion about this. And at the second round, uh, what actions we should take in detail, and also what actions there are in the world um, in a, a era with no feed and tariff. How many of those we have in Turkey? How many of those will be introduced in Turkey? Uh, these are the things that we'll be discussing. Now I'd like to give the floor to Emre first, because for the last 19 years actually he's been dealing with this matter. Garanti Bank in Turkey, not only the case for the wind, but especially for over 200 energy projects they've been financing, and I think 74 of those win. And therefore, you are very much um, familiar with the industry. Uh, what were the acceptances at that time? What we should be expecting now? Would you please go over the Thank you, Tuna. Thank you very much for the association for this nice event. Let me start with 10 years ago, I guess, almost 10 years ago, what uh, we've been discussing, especially, uh, let's just have an outlook on this. As you would remember, uh, we actually have huge growth rate, almost 7% of a growth rate in electricity generation at that time. And the investments were very few, there was energy deficit and huge need for investments. And um, the rate of the local uh, resources around 30%. Wind generation, I mean, electricity generation from wind was almost none. The share of renewables was around 15% at that time. We were dependent on import by 70%, mainly natural gas. Uh, over 50% of dependency over the natural gas, as you would remember, uh, this we were even uh, uh, 
discussing at that time that this 50 percent would go up rather than going down and there was actually a huge share of um, the public in generation and distribution almost totally public and the banks were asked how we are just supposed to finance the investments who is supposed to do this how we are going to cover for this energy deficit around a hundred billion dollars worth of an investment expected at that time of course at that time uh, despite so many risks the banks uh, the investors you know um, we believe in the industry and we did the investment and this hundred billion US dollars worth of an investment made the privatization scheme completed 25 billion US dollars of actually money get into the Treasury some of the hydroelectric power plants from the allocations and so and um, private sector did what the public should do and this burden was shared by the banks and the investors at that time as you would remember it was 12 cents the, I'm speaking about the spot electricity price 12 cents 2009 9 cents you know 12 9 cents those and the projection was 10 cents all the reports were saying uh, the no, prices will never go down 10 cents actually there will be deficit of supply and that was the expectation as a result of the investments what happened yes right we have more consumption but there is actually a supply surplus and as a result of this and of course with the decrease in the oil prices rather than 10 cents 4.7 4.8 cents i mean uh, the average for 12 months i can say uh, for the last three and a half years i checked 4.7 cents that's constant i mean over the us dollar for the last uh three and a half years i'm not saying monthly i'm saying the 12 year average so the price settled i can say so quite uh, lower than the expectation uh, but of course some of the positive things as well uh, first of all we have more share of uh, the local contribution uh, we're at 60 percent thanks to the um, hydroelectricity power plant and from 15 to 30 for renewables is 47 percent for the first nine months i mean 47 percent of the generation from solar uh, wind and geothermal and hydroelectricity that's important uh, what I mean is uh, to generate one unit of electricity I mean we actually pay less for import how does that happen thanks to Yekdem that's what I always argue 25 over 25,000 megawatts uh, of the project portfolio uh, in Yekdem including those without not licensed yet but and so we have less bill for import and uh, therefore electricity prices are lower and therefore Yektem contributed significantly to the Turkish economy from this perspective uh, it's also important to note that uh, price risk was taken with these investments that's the reason why we have some challenges what do I uh, mean by this in a world with nine twelve cents while making projections we reported that it would be ten cents as the banks we were cautious and we set more conservative prices I mean at least specific to guarantee bank I can say we have a specific projection model for supply and demand and um, we knew that there would be supply surplus that much that you expect do you predict no not that much but it was not a big surprise I'm speaking about the supply and demand side why I mean the supply side is actually what is under the control of the bank because it's not possible to have a large-scale project without any financing what does that mean the project will come to the banks eventually so uh, we actually could see the projects it was like a heavy rain all the projects falling on the table uh, in 2010 you know uh, I mean uh, there will be natural gas for in each and every city so the base load requirement will be met I do remember very well in our uh, our team was expecting almost 50 projects from natural gas so you are saying that uh, 
the wind uh, industry thought that this is only us, but of course the other uh, uh, fields are. I mean, the investors sometimes cannot see the big picture. I mean, they don't know about the project applications and um, therefore they actually have a narrow perspective but we of course have a holistic approach also from hpps and so because we said that if all projects are completed it would be a disaster we said a natural gas uh, power plant for each uh, city it didn't happen of course why because banks were selective uh, they did not give financing for all projects there's supply surplus but it could have been worse um, now, of course, there is so much investment. Once you finance it, even if there is actually an increase by five to six percent in the demand, uh, there will be a surplus. But we were actually mistaken as well. If there are some project problems in some of the projects and there is a need for a workup, uh, if you're asking me, the biggest factor in here is not the difference between the supply and the demand, but the reduction in the oil and natural gas prices. Actually, we couldn't predict it. I'm just frankly saying that uh, in until 2014, the Brent, uh, which is the most important indicator uh, for natural gas, 100, 110, it was in that band. Looking at the uh, last four to five years, 110 dollars in the projections, minimum 80 dollars in all international reports all and it is uh, such a commodity that you cannot make any projection of a uh, supply and demand at the world i mean how are you supposed to predict it clearly not possible therefore at this point 70 80 us dollars i mean the feasibilities were done accordingly over the basis of that price but i think in august 2014 if i'm not mistaken starting by that time it goes down to fifty dollars and 2015 18 45 to 50 and it just remained there i mean automatically of course it uh, reduces the prices down one one and a half cents so it was a mistake on the top of the supply and demand issue so we end up with these problems but yes it's okay there are problematic projects and they are being corrected to the extent possible we do work up and so i think wind industry is the only industry that is problem free i can say it is very smooth really i mean we created a success story in energy how at least we actually have supply security i mean there uh, is actually it's a success story we have supply security and we did it by reducing the prices it's an important fact, but of course, in the success story, the champion is the wind. Uh, 7,500 megawatts of projects, 2,500 that we finance, maybe a couple of more projects that I put aside some different problems, but they all pay back their credits smoothly in time, even early payment. Uh, it means that the wind industry is doing pretty well. Uh, of course, we could have reached to larger volumes, no doubt about this, but at least we should enjoy the fact that the projects that we finance, the projects that are operational, that are active, the wind stock that we have right now is making money and they pay their credits back. What does that mean? The banks will have a positive look uh, for these projects. I think it is important for the upcoming projects. Uh, trust me, that disaster that you mentioned initially is much better for wind, we can say. So can I say that wind and renewables in total, of course, we have less dependency abroad. And so as to reduce the price that is now in the mix, energy mix, and the prices are reduced. Now for the power plants that reduces those uh, prices, we no more have feed and tariff, no more incentives. What is the life that they should be expecting? You're saying that the prices are fixed. Will it be fixed for long? What are your pro uh, projections? Now, looking at the upcoming decade, I can say, uh, investments slow down uh, because there's a huge base load capacity of Turkey thermal power plants that we have we have good capacity and i don't think we will have large-scale thermal power plants anymore uh, 
I mean, except for some of the projects that reach to a certain level. I mean, a natural gas power plant from scratch, not possible, or, or by taking a price risk. A thermal power plant, not possible, I guess. What we're going to do for energy requirement is solar, wind, geothermal, biomass, uh, these will be the priors for the upcoming six years. It is 2,500 megawatts annually solar wind biomass that we predict. I mean, it will be 15,000 uh, megawatts in six years time for consumption around 4%. I mean, average increase uh, 4% annually. So 300 billion will be around 380 billion by the end of 2025. So. This 15,000 megawatt, the 40 billion kilowatt hour, I mean, if you add it on the top of this, there will be a deficit of 40 in six years. So what do I mean? If we actually believe that the Turkish economy will grow, which we totally believe, I'm not speaking about the growth rates or so on. I mean, we can speak about the risk, but if there's going to be a growth, there will be a growth. Despite of all these investments, 15,000 megawatts, by 2025, there still will be energy deficit. So you're saying it will increase the prices. Yes, eventually, yes. Okay, then at this point, I would like to give the floor to Jan. Uh, actually, uh, he actually is the um, president of the uh, Electricity Generation uh, society we listen to the bank side uh, from your side what would you say i mean what we should expect for the future i would like to thank to the association and you as the board member for this event and the panel uh, actually from what emre said i will continue and i actually uh, will uh, speak about what we should consider for the future First of all, the system uh, reached to 90,000 megawatts, and it is 45,000 megawatts. Maybe it is over that for this year. It means that on paper, we have a surplus, no doubt about this. Uh, while we were doing those investments, we were considering very high growth rates. We no more have that much yet, and uh, also, 1.4 percent of a reduction in electricity consumption i mean there is therefore less demand as of today for electricity uh, contrary to the predictions uh, probably after 2023 uh, this um, actually maybe there is a supply right now but it will go down uh, these are long-term investments energy investments therefore uh, probably we should not wait that much long. Therefore, we should start taking actions immediately. So, um, just like the beginning of the year 2000, we no more will have energy deficit. Despite the surplus, um, we also have some transmission problems, and we cannot actually abandon some of the power plants. Even some of the natural gas power plants that work in low productivity, they work round the clock. I mean, uh, we're, I mean, the state is trying not to pay so much money to make them operational, but still, it's not about how much megawatts you have, how much you can consume, that's not the case. I mean, you somehow have to make a balance in that. And right now, at the side of the private sector, until the end of 2020, I mean, up to the, other than those under YECDAM, we don't have so many significant projects, but uh, it's not only at the wind side we are speaking about quite significant numbers uh, like the turbines that mentioned I mean the manufacturers mentioned about this it means that uh, a one to two thousand megawatts uh, will be operational only at the wind side I guess some of those will get 2020 with some provisional acceptance but will increase by 2021 so there will be an increase in the renewables, I guess. Other than those, what we can have in hand, there are a couple of public projects, as you all know. Two major 
promoting projects that might affect the Anujimix nuclear, for example, 2023 for the first unit, uh, 1200 times four units, so 4,800 megawatts. The nuclear and the second is the local lignite sites fields are now being improved. AUH will get 5,000 megawatts. And there will be an auction also for the uh, lignite, but this also will have an impact as well. I mean, 10,000 megawatt on the top of this. So the decrease in demand, uh, so you're saying that there will not be a reduction in supply. I mean, these two projects are debatable. We don't know whether they will be the case or not, but if they are introduced, I guess we'll be discussing about this. Uh, we don't know where the prices will go, especially for the post yektem That's the reason why I'm giving these figures. For renewable, 44,000 megawatts, around that. In total, I mean, in Turkey. In wind, we expect a huge increase. I mean, I take 2026 as the basis, only in wind. There could be some varying numbers. I mean, maybe it's wrong to tell these numbers, maybe at least 10,000 megawatts. Maybe 15,000 megawatts that will be introduced. I mean, again, solar uh, will uh, contribute significantly for this. I think in solar, in my opinion, it is going to be scattered distribution, scattered uh, generation rather than massive ones. In natural gas, 26,000 megawatts that we have, 10,000 megawatts are the high productivity power plants. Of course, we don't know how much of those uh, will uh, continue. You also probably know it from the media and the press that some of the power plants are in trouble. But for wind power plants, as you all know, the renewables, there's the battery storage. Uh, we also should be waiting for this. I think natural gas power plants are acting as a balancing power in here. And uh, they are scattered in the region, especially in the places where there's so much wind, they actually have to be kept operational. And uh, I think Gökçükaya project that we have, I think for nuclear and the others, it's all important. So looking at the problems that today that we have, I mean, for wind power plants, what is going to happen in the post yektem period? $73 cents plus minus three. So it comes to $45, $46 as Emre said, it will go down that. And it is not going to be constant, I guess. Uh, during spring, I mean, there will be some seasonal variations. So I guess the cash flow at the same time will not be um, good. It will be different. And by 2020, 621, 1,000 megawatts. Uh, again, hydro at the same time will go out. In 2022, it is uh, going to be slowing down. Uh, I mean, but after 2023, majority of the projects will be out of Yektem. So it will be and after feeding tariffs, so we have to discuss how the wind power plants are going to make money. So, uh, mostly the natural gas or the lignite coal uh, discussed about this a lot, but uh, there are some dynamics forming the electricity prices, but you have to be a party to this. Why? Uh, there are certain political attempts in electricity price. Uh, there's the as you all know, there is the policy of providing subsidies to the industry through the energy prices. And therefore, the state actually has the authority and the right uh, to set the prices. It should not be the case. It's been discussed so many times that it is not a good thing. And uh, of course, the industry should be subsidized, but it should be like direct subsidy. And um, I know it's not the topic of the panel, but the support over the prices in particular uh, will be of the interest of the uh, majority of the electricity generators. And the other thing is lack of predictability in prices in particular, starting with cost, of course. 
it's a critical point, especially while working in the market. Again, uncertainty about the foreign exchange rate, it will affect the cash flow. Another important thing is, of course, the um, not having clarity about the regulations. This week, for example, there's a new topic on the agenda. For HPPs, 1.5% of a fee to be paid, um, and probably the base, tax base uh, will change. I don't know, maybe the same could happen for the wind power plants. I mean, there's no guarantee that this would not happen. I mean, um, because these things are causing some obstacle for the investments. Not only the Ministry of Energy, it means that some other ministries also should be involved on this. So, as for the upcoming period, for the power plants after feed and tariff, what they can do. Number two, what the new investors should do. Again, just two more points to mention. The first thing is that they actually will be making their own optimizations, but you know, so as to serve to these companies, there are some companies that are established for this. There are also practices abroad as well. They probably will mention about this, but. Uh, for example, purchase guarantee with fixed price to the extent possible it contributes to predictability. Or, um, for example, to make an agreement over the price that it has already formed. Uh, probably uh, there is a service fee and a target for uncertainty. I mean, there is actually a bonus given plus financial revenues. I don't know. There are some issues at the cash flow. or. Maybe again, there will be certain. I mean, there, will, there are some companies that can offer some services. I'm sure uh, later in the next round we'll discuss about this. So, different um, approaches could be the case. And for the new investors, uh, lastly, uh, so we have two models, as you all know the YECA model, it's an ongoing model, and um, again, mini. Yekas. I think it's just like a competitor uh, to uh, YEC them, and also Maxi and the ECTEM itself. At the ECTEM uh, side, our society has been working on this. You know, we are uh, talking to the public agencies and we offer different things like pricing mechanisms. And as you would appreciate, the state has the fear that I will set this price just like in the past, in 10 years time. What if it is going to be very expensive, too high? What if they will criticize me? I think it is possible to address these problems, of course, but so there are two pieces of legislation by the government. And one, we have the decree, another decree of the president. Uh, So these are actually proposals very similar uh, to today. I mean, probably it's going to be at lower prices. And they are ready to be sent to the parliament. But unfortunately, two weeks ago, uh, they started to discuss whether the incentives, the support should be in Turkish lira. So it's a bit chaotic there. So we don't know, I mean, to what extent it can be financed over the Turkish liras. The second thing is that about the localization incentives uh, would radically change. Uh, also, there was actually criticism from abroad. Uh, rather than a price support, I don't know, maybe some little will be left, but it would be over OPEX and CAPEX. I mean, mechanisms that will provide support for this, like incentives, maybe reducing transmission fee and so on. If possible, I don't know. We could not have any good coordination among different ministries, but maybe from the industry side, the support to be given to the generators is discuss the auction. I also taken down notes about the auction. Some of the auctions in the past. I mean, did not uh, realize as people desire. So there are a couple of suggestions. Maybe the best thing is actually to get a high price initially. I'm just, you know, saying it quickly, but 
or maybe asking for a very high guarantee from the winner, or if they fail, for example, uh, to fulfill the deadlines, maybe an increasing incremental uh, guarantee. My society is saying that maybe we actually should have a pre-selection process for the process, uh, projects, I mean. So that's all I would like to say. Thank you. It's been quite comprehensive. Well, thank you. Probably you've covered all the sectors, subsectors of the electricity industry. But one thing that really captured my attention is we've come to this debate from price, but price essentially, not only in the short run, but also in the long run, may be quite difficult for us to predict as a parameter in the electricity sector. Now, at this point in time, I'd like to turn to Mr. Gonzalez, because now we are discussing how we have come to this point how this change has happened through which uh, points. But let's better take a look at what has happened in Europe. I mean, what has uh, changed in Turkey maybe uh, has somehow uh, been indexed to uh, Europe in general, maybe Spain in particular. Are there similarities? What is, ex what, what is there that we should be expecting for the future? Well, thank you very much. Also, thank you very much for the invitation and for this opportunity to talk to all of you. Um, well, over the last decade, we have seen that uh, renewable technologies have matured. We have seen also prices have decreased uh, very significantly. And of course, in Europe, that has led to a massive deployment of renewables, especially in some countries. Um, yeah, of course, we have seen also that uh, conventional plants, old coal plants, nuclear plants, have also been decommissioned in the last uh, years. And uh, this is probably something we should uh, ask ourselves. What is the effect of this substitution of technologies in the uh, market dynamics? So today I would like to speak about uh, Germany and Spain. Right? I want to uh, explain a bit what has happened there in the last years also in order to find some similarities with Turkey right, and uh, try to understand and, and see if the experience that happened there can help us to forecast or predict a bit what will happen in the future, especially regarding uh, power prices. Why uh, Germany and Spain? Well, Germany and Spain have been uh, deploying renewable technologies, especially uh, onshore wind, uh, for 20 years now. Of course, uh, supported by very generous uh, feed-in tariffs, but what we are seeing now is that uh, this 20 years are finishing and a lot of um, renewable developers and re uh, renewable owners are uh, seeing the end of feed-in tariffs yeah, and will now have to face the market, yeah, will now have to face the market risk. Yeah? I'm talking for Germany, for instance, 2025, we're talking about 16 gigawatts of onshore wind. In Spain, we're talking about 8 gigawatts of onshore wind. They will run out of feed-in tariffs. Um, so, yeah, this is a bit of a similar situation to what we're seeing here in Turkey. But first, let me a bit explain uh, about the energy mix in Spain and, and Germany. What you see here is the uh, capacity, the installed capacity in Spain and how it has evolved over the years. Yeah? We see that uh, we have uh, the installed capacity, it's around uh, 100 gigawatts, and it's uh, divided between conventional gas, coal, also nuclear, and uh, on the other side, we have renewables, mainly uh, onshore wind and hydro, similar to Turkey. Uh, in terms of onshore wind, what we see uh, or what we have um, in, in Spain is 23 gigawatts of wind, and around four to five gigawatts are being constructed right now. Yeah. In terms of uh, price, uh, yeah, uh, power prices, what we see in Spain is that there is a, a huge correlation between the output of hydro and wind on power prices. Yeah? This is also the reason why in Spain we have, for instance, high, the highest power prices in September. Why September? We have low uh, wind output, and also after a dry uh, summer, we have no hydro available. So that is explaining these high prices. Of course, when we talk about renewables, we can also talk about the correlation of renewables. If Spain would have more solar in their system, yeah, this. Uh, this impact in September would be uh, balanced to some extent because uh, renewables, uh, especially on uh, wind and solar, are balancing itself depending on the season. Yeah. 
So when we talk about Germany, well, many people have probably heard about Germany. Germany has an amazing experience in terms of uh, renewal deployment. They started very early, 20 years ago, with uh, very generous uh, feed-in tariffs for onshore. Later on, solar PV came into the game. And um, yeah, but uh, and we still have like uh, a lot of coal and, and gas in the system, while nuclear is being uh, decommissioned. So in terms of power prices, what we see in Germany is that over the last years, the average uh, power prices have been decreasing, uh, mainly due to the impact of renewables entering the system. But of course, this effect has been balanced to some extent also through other factors, like for example, the nuclear phase out. Yeah? So uh, as I said before, we have many assets that are running out of feeding tariffs, these assets that were built 20 years ago, and then they have to face the, um, the market now. So um, what are the similarities between, or other similarities between Turkey and these two markets? Well, these three markets are uh, a big part of its power generation produced through conventional plants, right? I'm talking about uh, coal and gas. So the power prices are very uh, sensitive to the fluctuations of commodities, as we have uh, uh, heard before um, here. So uh, this is determining, uh, to some extent, the power prices. And it's uh, going to uh, continue being like this, at least while we have a lot of uh, conventional capacity in the market. Another, uh, another similarity with Turkey is that um, Turkey, Spain, and Germany, they have a huge potential of renewable. And if they really continue with their plans of introducing more and more renewables into the system, we will see probably similar effects in terms of power prices in the future. So um, probably this is known by some of you, but uh, I would like to uh, briefly explain the merit order curve and the merit order uh, effect of renewables. Right? What you see here, or what what you see here, is like uh, the different technologies or different technologies that you can have in a country. As you know, uh, the demand is covered by different technologies, and each technology has a different marginal cost. Marginal costs are determined uh, through the operating expenses. So what determines the preference? or uh, the dispatch order is this marginal costs. So what you see in this image is, for instance, that uh, renewables, solar, wind, nuclear, will have a dispatch preference over coal and gas. This is the normal case. Yeah? So what, uh, when we, and then of course, when demand meets uh, generation, power generation, we get the power price. So what happens, what, when, we call, when we talk about the merit order effect of renewables, what does it mean? What it means is that if we introduce more renewables into the system, we're displacing the more expensive um, power plants. So in this case, it would be coal and gas. We're displacing them out of the curve, and uh, as a result, power prices fell. Yeah? This is something, for instance, that we have seen in Germany. Um, and since we have talked about Germany, I want also to show you this effect on a specific week in Germany. This is the first week of uh, May 2017. And what we see here are different effects. First, this merit order effect of renewables. What we see in this first two days is that we have solar and a lot of wind producing during these two first days. What happens? Conventional generation is being ramped down, produces very little output because, of course, we have a dispatch order. And as a result, we have low prices. Now, what happens the next two days? This is a real example. What happens the next two days? Suddenly, wind stopped producing to a very low level, and uh, conventional plants, gas, coal, have to ramp up quickly to cover that gap that wind is leaving. As a result, we see an, a huge increase in power prices. Yeah? This is uh, what we are expecting also in the future. Now, I don't know if you have seen it, but maybe you have seen also a third effect that is uh, reflected in this graph, and it's negative prices. What we see also in Germany, is, and also in other countries, is that renewables are uh, resulting in, in that in some hours we have negative prices. Why this happens? Well, we have a lot of output of renewables and we have inflexible uh, power, uh, conventional power generators that cannot uh, uh, shut down the, the generation. Plus, we have also some fixed contracts where, had that, where power has to be produced uh, constantly. So we have these negative prices. In Germany in 2007, it was 146 hours of negative prices with an average price of 20, minus 27 euro per megawatt hour, which is huge. 
Yeah. And this trend, this phenomena, is going to increase in the future. This is something we can predict. So if we look a bit uh, and we take everything together and we try to make uh, uh, yeah, like a prediction of how the prices will evolve in the future, we have to take into account these two effects. First, more renewables in the system are pressing down the, the power prices during many hours. But of course, we will have also some hours where we have uh, conventional generation that has to quickly ramp up yeah, and will have to cover this demand that renewables cannot do. Yeah? I'm talking, for instance, about uh, gas as a good, good candidate. So we'll have lower prices during many hours, but very high prices during some other hours. Right? So this is something uh, we should take into account. And I would like to ta uh, talk about this in the next round. Yeah. Let's or, talk about the next round. Okay. This, yeah, should I continue? Or? Uh, <clears throat> about price forecasting, I mean, we are going to focus on the next round. Okay, perfect. Okay. Then I will, I will lead you with this idea. Power price forecasting, what's going to happen in the future, will be crucial in order to take uh, decision making for uh, energy assets. Thank you, Mr. Gonzalez. Um, have you ever experienced negative prices? 140 hours in Germany. How about in Turkey? Negative prices do not exist as a mechanism in Turkey, but almost zero. There were times that we were close to zero in the past. We had a lot, but now not that much. Negative prices uh, probably we need to work on, but not yet. Okay, we'll come back to that in the second round. How about you, Enes Tatbak? Um, Mr. Tatbak has been active in eight countries. It's a, you're a representative of a major company, and uh, you, we know that about eight, 16 gigawatts, uh, you're operating a portfolio, you're selling power, energy. Uh, some do belong to you, some not, but you're operating it. In the UK, to my knowledge, uh, you have an expertise about the projects without any incentive. Uh, Mr. Gonzalez referred to negative prices. Okay, we say we are down to a uh, zero level and prices keep getting down. But how do you see it? What is to come up in Turkey? Hello. Uh, first, that I'm really proud to be a part of the panel. Since 2016, uh, we've been working in the UK onshore uh, and incentives have been lifted in the UK as the wind power. We need to change ourselves vis-a-vis -vis this change. I mean, it's been so sudden of an experience. So I'd like to share our experiences with you, having uh, gone through this process quite suddenly. But what do we expect to see in the market? I will try and summarize it in seven bullets. But before that, I'd like to highlight two benefits that uh, will be there after the reduction of the incentives. With the lifting of the, or maybe with the diminishing of the incentives, all the stakeholders in the market, I mean, from turbine producers to insurance providers to electricity traders or finance providers, I think everyone uh, will spend some, you know, time in how to reduce the cost. Probably they'll be building some new departments, bringing new people in as to how we can lower the price. Is. Well, and, and I do think that maybe linked to this first advantage, the second advantage is that we'll see a lot of variety, diversity, um, maybe about, uh, I mean, the products that never existed there, we'll see uh, the new coming products or the turbine providers will come with brand new type of turbines. I mean, these are the two uh, benefits that we are likely to see in the future. What else can we see in the market? I do, I do predict seven items to come up so quickly I'll get into that the first one is that the market price risk will be reduced but for that there may be several options the most known is corporate PPA in the markets where the incentives are lifted, this is this has evolved. Like in France, there is no corporate PPA market as the incentives are there. But in Scandinavian countries, Germany and the UK, corporate PPA has paved the way, I think. 15 up to 20 years, uh, totally, uh, which will be up. I mean, there there can be many flexibilities from five to twenty years. There can be variety of options. 
How many years is it in Tur Turkish market and the corporate PPA? How many years? One year, maybe, mostly sold in the commercial market. Other than that, off-taker PPA um, is also another option. This may be for the distribution companies. They will come up in the future with five-year PPAs on fixed price. As the third option, some insurance companies um, or financial institutions will st have already started uh, pr providing products like financial hedging. The second thing I'm expecting for the market is um, the PowerPoint owners may try and uh, diversify their uh, revenues and by taking a role in the balancing market or by uh, taking role in the financial uh, balancing or the reserve markets. It, would it be possible like uh, we can have uh, the diversification of our revenues on the from the electricity market maybe we can expect some changes some improvement there third already discussed hybrid projects maybe we can see hybrid projects uh, we've made a study in the UK about the position of the hybrid projects whether they are economically feasible but the electricity prices there stay quite stable uh, therefore uh, the since the battery costs are still high there Economically speaking, oh, we couldn't achieve any feasible project. Maybe, but maybe before the electricity prices fluctuating in Turkey, daytime, nighttime, in Turkey there can be an opportunity for investment. The next point, I, I think, it's the fourth bullet. Capture rate is the phenomenon that I'd like to refer to. This is, this means roughly. As the amount of wind energy uh, increases in the system, the uh, annual electricity energy revenues that will be achieved uh, by your power plant will be somehow lower than the average. In the UK, it is around 8 to 10 percent. <coughs> According to the future predictions, it will be somehow higher. And about the capture rate, uh, again, maybe going with the negative prices. Also, it's linked somehow. Probably in the future, this is going to be one of the aspects that the investors are expected to consider. The fifth uh, point or bullet that I'm expecting is um, that the investors will need to uh, readjust you know, themselves because they have really big experience in the Turkish market and the technology risk is down to minimum in Turkey. So probably they'll be more relaxed and will be lowering their IRRs. Um, but also about the lifespan of the projects, there's one more point, but we'll come to that in the second round. You can briefly refer to that. Yes, this is about the project lifespan. I'll just briefly touch upon to that. Maybe we'll get into details later. In Europe, in the next four years, uh, the pro the amount of projects that come to the 25 year lifetime is around 25 gigawatts. And here, there are some um, owners that think about depowering, totally de decommissioning uh, the, the 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 turbines, the power plants, and some owners do expand the life of their power plants, which we, I think, can see also uh, in the Turkish market, and I'll get to that uh, at last. There are two more things. One is in the future, there may be new products and opportunities about integration, as in Ireland and the UK, like in the UK, for instance, the battery storage of uh, 200 kilowatts. Uh, I mean, they've started getting s s service uh, from that the distribution company is getting those services and about integration there can be interesting opportunities in the future and the last point is about electricity uh, prices uh, predictions for the future as renewables installed capacity increases in the future essentially the um, um, versus uh, carbon prices and the natural gas prices, I think the electricity prices will no longer be dependent on these two. 
Well, thank you. In general, you've recovered uh, the evolution of the sector in Turkey. So this has been a general wrap up of what we can expect for the future. Now, coming to the second round, I'm going to expect brief answers from you because we need some room for questions and answers. Probably the audience will have some questions to ask. We keep talking about price, but let's just continue about pricing. Embre, I mean, you said it's not that much predictable in your presentation. You said that. Uh, what about your own price prediction model? And then I will ask Mr. Gonzalez because they have a similar service, but that is not, I think, provided in Turkey in a European market under which conditions and uh, in which accuracy can you make a prediction of prices? First, Emre Hatem, our model is totally the same with the PTF <coughs> working model. It's working on an hourly basis. What do we do? First, existing all power plants are listed it down. These are operational power plants. Their capacities, availabilities on an hourly basis uh, will be just listed down. And then uh, we just make a, a prediction as to what kind of new investments can be made. What are the, uh, the, the power plants in the pipeline, let's say. We add their hourly uh, basis. So we have on an hourly basis availability database. And then, again, on an hourly basis, we make a consumption projection. We take the hourly data, and with a given growth, but without tricking on the low profile, because it may just depend on the day, and there may be hourly shifts within the day, but without tricking on the low existing low load profile, we uh, get in these data. And, of course, we add the, uh, the oil prices, gas prices, commodity prices, you know, uh, the operating costs, investment, of course, all of this fed in because each power plant will have both the OPEX and the CAPEX that we need to know. And then, then the model makes a simulation on an hourly basis, taking the supply and demand. I mean, what is the need for that hour? 40, uh, 45,000 megawatts. And then from the lowest to the highest prices, they, it sorts out the um, power plants and the barter prices are detected and then we make a prediction about which power plants can work in that time span and the EBITDA can also be calculated. At the end of the day, the model works accurately. How do we know? Because when you enter the actual past prices, it gives, you know, plus minus 3% of accuracy. So we think there is no problem about the accuracy of the model, but at the end of the day, the biggest problem is about predictability. Uh, supply and demand is a local factor. I mean, the more the, the about uh, how much investments can be made in the coming five to six years, we do have yes a a projection with high predictability because it's us. I mean, as the sector to finance it, so the chances of being mistaken will be l l low. But on the demand side, we are not that mistaken. But oil and natural gas prices, I think, are quite critical. And I do agree that absolutely, as solar and wind investments are made, uh, the natural gas power plants price uh, determination will be lower. But as I said, if the Turkish economy grows by around four percent and consumption in parallel by four percent speaking about even if we make a 15,000 megawatts of investment the uh, the amount of time the amount of hours that the natural gas will be uh, determinant will again be 8,000 hours of the year I mean 8,000 hours of the year and you're dependent on a, on some amount of natural gas so you cannot just go through the cycle without uh, no natural gas at all I mean, you don't need it at all, but if there is a six, 26 gigawatts of installed capacity, maybe your need is 5,000 megawatts. It's not going to be 20,000 megawatts, but you need 5,000. And the question is, if we push all the natural gas out of the system, there will be an energy deficit. But who is to buy that 5,000? Uh, how can we define it within 26,000? And of course, that 5,000 megawatt will be working in so low uh, threshold that it will not be able to compensate for its interest and will not survive. So this is the very problem that we are experiencing. And in the coming period, it will continue to be a problem. And in terms of predictions and predictability, 
Yes, there are severe risks to face, and in particular, we're speaking about the oil prices coming down from 100 to 50. No one predicted that. I mean, if there is someone who made that prediction, probably he is rich. I mean, we'll just come down 50 in two months and we'll stay there for four years. I mean, there is no projection model that can make this prediction. But it happened. M maybe after this point onwards, the oil prices are this and it'll get down to this as a minimum, impossible to say. Another thing is, when you take a look at the gas contacts of Botash, the oil distribution company, the formula depends on brand, fuel oil, gas oil, brand-based products. So the formula they're using, even if we don't know the formula for sure, we know that these are the products that do exist. And we calculate that there is the Russian contract, Iranian, Azerbaijan contract. The major pipeline contracts have an average term of eight, nine years. And in this time, I mean, up after eight, nine years, they will be terminated. So we'll sit and negotiate with Gazprom, Iran. And probably the pricing formulas will change there. If the new, I mean, formula will again be dependent on brand or spot gas prices, NBP, or uh, the spot gas market in Turkey or whether there will be a combination of that, we don't know about it. So in 10 to 15 years of time, when you make a projection, the risk will come up after eight years. Why is this important? Because oil projection is totally different. Gas is another story. And gas prices are quite low if you would pay attention in Europe. I mean, now we're up to 60 from 50. So the oil keeps rising, but the spot oil price, um, gas prices are getting down. Like our, if our formula were dependent on spot gas, the prices were to get lower. But it, since it's oil, it's getting to be slightly higher. So the unknowns there make it difficult for us to make a projection. But Mr. Gonzalez, what would you say at this very point? And this is what you do professionally. You deliver that service. How would you comment? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, what I really want to say is that uh, understanding the market risk is becoming key, and it will be more and more important in the future. We're seeing that subsidies are being limited, or we are seeing even projects, especially in Europe, in Spain, for instance, uh, or also in Northwest Europe, where we have subsidy-free projects coming out of auctions. So facing the market risk will become more and more important. Now, what can we do from the point in time we are now? So what we can do is use the best, the state-of-the-art technology, softwares, and do the best assumptions regarding, as uh, you perfectly commented, commodity prices, demand, how is the energy mix uh, developing, uh, what are the costs for different technologies, what is the intermittency, the, the generation forecast of, of renewables. There's so many variables we have to take assumptions on. So the best possible thing to do is to do it the best way, do the best assumptions, consulting also with uh, the, the best experts on that and those specific topics and using state of the art uh, software. So what we do, we, it's true that we don't offer the service for Turkey, but we offer the service for most of Europe. And what we have in Europe is a very complex system because it's very interconnected and it will be more and more interconnected in the future. So when we want to model, for instance, uh, power prices, and we're not talking about power prices for the next 10 years. We're talking about power prices from now until 2050. Of course, as you go into the future, you will meet more and more uncertainty. That's, that's true. That's inevitable. Yeah? But when we talk about power price forecasting in Europe, we have to also take into account what's happening in uh, other regions. Commodity prices is a huge uh, factor, very important. But of course, as you get more and more renewables into a system, the system gets also decoupled from a, co a conventional generation. Also, what is very important is the um, regulatory risk. Or when I speak about regulatory risk, I speak also about the goals. What are the goals that the government are setting in, uh, in terms of deployment of renewables? And are they going to meet those goals? Based on that and based on how the technologies are behaving, we can more or less um, forecast prices. But of course, you cannot take that for granted. It's not a golden rule. Based on what you have, the best, what you call the DNVGL most likely future, you can, of course, do sensitivities by moving some variables, as, for instance, commodity prices. Um, I would like to show you, for instance, one of uh, what we do, uh, for instance, for Germany and Spain. What you see here is the energy mix. You saw before the energy mix 
uh, in the past and in the present. Now I want to show you how we forecast the energy mix of Spain and Germany into the future. If you look at this image, you will see that, you will, that Germany and Spain, from our perspective and based on also our outlook until 2050, is will, uh, will become a lot of more renewables into the system, solar, wind, also offshore in, um, in Germany. Conventional plants, as, uh, in terms of nuclear coal, will be phased out, not because of their economics, it's because of a political decision, yeah, because of the high emissions. And, of course, you will need gas. Gas is uh, it's very important in order to deal and cope with the intermittency of renewables. So we have this energy mix, we forecast this energy mix, we, do, we set these assumptions on very different factors, and then we run the model. So to, to give you an idea, when we run this software, we need 17 hours for modeling one year. So it, because it's a very complex model, we, we complete, we're modeling whole Europe, yeah, because it's so much interconnected. What happens in France will affect what's going on in Spain. The, 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 the hydro state of, of Norway will affect prices in, in, in Portugal. This is, this is, and this will increase and become uh, more and more common. Now, what I want to show you here is, for instance, uh, an example of a power price forecast uh, for one of the European countries. And what we see, many people think, okay, more renewables into a system means average prices will go down. Well, not necessarily. And not necessarily because we will have also high, as I said before, uh, uh, spikes of, 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 of prices, right? More renewables press many hours down, but of course you will have, of course, gas being coming into the game at some point. You will have also something that is not so relevant in, in, in Turkey, but in Europe, carbon prices. Yeah? This will also affect, of course, the marginal cost of, of, of gas power plants. Yeah? So what we see is, on average, a uh, stable price in this specific country. But what is more interesting, and we have commented this before, is what is the captured price for the renewable assets? Yeah? What, is, what is the capture price? The capture price is actually the revenues that the renewable assets will make by selling the the, the power to the, into the market. Yeah? So we, would, we could say we have a stable, into the future, we have a stable average power price, but then the revenues of the renewable assets will decrease. Why? Because they're producing exactly at the same time where the, all the other renewable assets are producing. This means prices are being pushed down. And what we see here in the second is, image is how the captured prices are, uh, are going down for renewable assets, especially for solar. So this is something we should also take into account when we look into the future. But definitely, power price forecasting is necessary. It's becoming more and more important. This is why we also have developed the system, the service. And uh, I'd agree, I agree with you completely. Next year, we will be cleverer than today, and we will have a better, maybe better perspective. But from the point in time we are now, this is the best we can do. Thank you. Jam, despite all the uh, uncertainty, we as the owners of the power plant will try to uh, estimate for prices. We'll use some hedging tools so as to overcome the problems that we have and the risks. But um, if you power plant owners take these these actions, uh, they will uh, be much ready for the upcoming period. What are the things that you can say about this? Now, at the post yekdem era, what do the, can we say about the power plants? What they can do? What actions can they uh, t uh, take? Uh, first of all, considering all these strategies, I mean, I don't think there's the need to change any of the principles that we have now, but for the forecasts uh, and increasing the performance would be much more important. Why? Because there will be a reduction in the revenues and uh, there will be a negative impact of this and it will be felt more. Uh, for better forecast performance, uh, we can consider several issues. Very few companies, as much as I know, do make forecasts on turbine basis. And uh, you're speaking about the generation forecast, right? Yes, generation forecast. And um, there are several things that we can develop about the models. Plus, minus, we check for the direction of the system, but with the prices, it is possible to give more sensitive prices, especially we need new mathematical models. But operational power plant, I think there is a need to provide for good feedback to the consultant companies so they can make better forecasts. 
and uh, the intraday market at the same time uh, will also have an effect on the uh, wind industry is relied on and probably things will not go on this way there will be certain limitations as well in the future uh, so there will be some unbalance from there but maybe there will be less effect of this therefore active balancing groups especially uh, for the companies that provide these services would be the case or maybe there will be cluster of companies to do something about this the balancing prices when compared to europe in turkey it is lower it is less I mean, i'm the bad guy by saying this but i don't know maybe we could so you are saying that is actually the sanction imposed uh, to the one that causes the imbalance you mean I mean, it's not a sanction, it's not like a ticket that you pay, but uh, you actually get a, uh, there's over net prices. Uh, there's only one price, as you all know, given looking at Germany, for example, the directions are different. And there could be some different prices. I don't know, sometimes we talk about this, but there are some 15 minutes of prices and once the directions are changing the prices will become much more clear maybe plus minus uh, again there would be maybe the uh, time of two sms if you are asking me especially uh, especially there should not actually be any penalty for becoming obsolete I mean, as you know, our society has been working on this before the regulatory authority uh, for this. And there are two things that we discuss. For wind, the tolerance coefficient will be increased. And it looks like the authority will accept this. And the second thing is that there are some procedures for example that we perform at the revenues administration therefore the net position in particular is considered the TESH already accepted this especially about system use and the forest use use of forest fee will be so high as you all we no more have the incentives for this after yak them together with the price decrease they also can be fatal i can say uh, different methodologies can well um, be uh, considered uh, so like workshops and so on i don't know maybe uh, we can have some increased methodologies that is conforming to the nature of the power plants, things that uh, the others would never remember. As uh, Emre stated, um, again, the long-term price and the cash flow in particular, uh, this is a tool that we actually can use. Other than that, in ITEP, what we defend is that at the same time, we at least should have the consumers therefore it actually would be an alternative to the uh, corporate ppa i mean it will be a long-term uh, stock exchange maybe it uh, even will turn into uh, a financing tool who knows one last thing for revenue generation carbon markets we don't have it but there are several ongoing activities about you mean the voluntary carbon market that we have but the prices are so low both actually at a piage there are two ongoing activities one we are included these are the green certificates that is on voluntary basis they are traded voluntarily at least for those who demand it and green electricity tariff even they probably will uh, i don't know announce this probably in 2020 that would be a sur surprise the second thing seems to be more challenging, but especially Oz John is working on this. That is the certificate of origin, mm, a real time, uh, like technological working over blockchain. You mean the origin will be identified at the rhythm? It's going to be parallel to the rhythm. It's not going to be limited to wind, of course.
For wind, actually, it is possible to identify it. Yes, they probably start with wind. And the other thing is that something that we don't like is the carbon tax. Ministry of Industry is working on this. If it is imposed as a tax, it will not be useful for the industry. Um, it is going to be used elsewhere. So the certificates that I discuss, whether they will be mandatory or on voluntary basis, I don't know. It's not so easy to do it in economy, but sometimes you can impose some. Or just like in the UK, uh, the obligatory certificates could also be the case. So um, this actually will provide some support for the power plants. I think it is going to be important for lobbying. And lastly, so as to for increasing the revenue, maybe increasing productivity could be one thing. Uh, for example, if there are power plants that are making money, it would be uh, good to make investment on power up, maybe. In, this, uh, in lifetime extension and repowering that you can mention about, but in an operational power plant, uh, what are you doing so as to increase productivity? But very quickly, please. I just want to divide it into how we can reduce cost and at the same time, the how we can increase the amount of energy generated. There are different lessons drawn. At the first stage, um, with regards to reducing the cost, there are three main things. What, that's what we advise to the companies. This could be for the new projects or for the already operating plants. One to be have a systematic approach. What I mean is that, uh, for example, you have $50 uh, of a certain cost and you'd like to decrease the cost for this, but this $50, if you don't know the breakdown of that $50, like with regards to PPA, what your cost is going to be, what is the share of insurance, and about your electricity expenditures. You have to know about the breakdown, 20, 30 sub items. If you cannot do this, then you cannot move to the next step. Therefore, I think the companies should have a more systematic approach. The second thing is standardization. It could be in design, or in purchasing, or it could be in the contracts itself. I mean, to have standardization in the portfolio. So it is possible to reduce the cost. The other thing is to have more communication with the stakeholders, uh, with several subcontractors, for example. You make subcontracts and uh, for outsourcing. And maybe you can, I don't know, have bilateral talks with them, how we can reduce the cost. For example, you mentioned about the cost. Especially you mentioned about the intraday costs. In the UK, uh, it was 7 to 8 percent your cost. What I mean is it is 7 or 8 percent of the electricity cost should be paid to the traders. Uh, so as to sell uh, your price to the market, sell your electricity to the market. We talk to them, for example. For if they told us that if we share half hourly uh, production with them, then they said we can reduce the cost. I mean, you can use that type of information. And uh, especially, we can get rid of what we do not need. For example, we were asking for a floor price. Uh, we know that we don't need this anymore. You can say that the 7 8% of cost can uh, significantly be reduced. And we reduce it down to 5%. Likewise, insurance brokers. You can talk to the insurance brokers. Sometimes some innovative modalities can be designed. That's what you can do. I mean, more communication with the stakeholders. If you address these three items, it would be much easier. The second thing I would like to mention is how we can increase production in a power plant. And uh, about the wind power plants, uh, over 22 wind power plants a survey was made and as a result of this report the amount of electricity operated by uh, rents is actually more than one percent of the market average 
you increase productivity, right? That's what you mean. Yes, I mean, you try to be much more productive and proactive than the other operators. So a 1% of an increase in electricity production, and it's a huge number. Very briefly, how they did it. Under two main things, I can say, main headings. The first thing is uh, four gigawatt of a power plant. Uh, if you're operating it uh, from over 30 turbines, you have millions of data flowing. So you can see all information, all data there. The second thing is that we have a team of 15 people. That is for the optimization of the power plants on them. I and they work on the for optimization, I mean, 15 uh, people. They have two tasks. The one thing is actually to identify the losses in the power plants and to minimize them. Maybe as an example, you have a power plant, two megawatt, for example. And um, it's actually a production in the range. It is 1.98 megawatt, for example, in the interval guaranteed. And our team can identify this 1.98, how you can increase it to two megawatts. I mean, they can make such propositions, for example, for the owners of the power plant. So. Maybe there are some losses that you consider to be normal, uh, but they make you aware of the fact that that's not normal, that is a loss, so uh, that's how they increase the production. The second of all, there is a condition monitoring system. Uh, the turbine manufacturers are doing the same thing. It is a preventive uh, repair and maintenance, like temp temperature, vibration, we get samples, oil samples, lubricants from the turbines. Based on the three data, you identify uh, which turbine will malfunction soon and so on. So you be, it's a proactive maintenance. And uh, for example, you said like the day with no wind. And so we increase productivity by this way. So these are the two methods, and somehow uh, we can optimize uh, the production there. Thank you very much. It's been very comprehensive. Uh, once the prices are down, uh, what the power plant owners uh, do or the stakeholders, maybe these are the things that we don't pay much attention. And probably these things would be much more important in the future. The next session will start at 4 o'clock. So if you have some questions, maybe just a couple that we can get, then we have to end the session. Any question to the speakers? Yes, please. Hello. My question is to Emre. In the upcoming period, uh, you mentioned that the predictability would be very low. We have so many variables, and we probably will suffer from the same problems as we did in the past. And especially for long-term PPAs, at which level they have to be so we can be much more predictable. I mean, because uh, uh, especially for uh, as a bank, what do you think uh, would be the case? For example, a price level as such uh, in a corporate PPA of 12, 15 years would be meaningful. Is there anything like this that you can say? For corporate PPAs, of course, we wish to have more corporate PPAs, no doubt about this. Uh, the investors asked us uh, if, for example, with a transmission company, I make a five-year contract, for example, uh, with a price guarantee. Do you think you will provide financing over this contract? They asked us a question, and they bring a feasibility study on this. We worked on this, and uh, we found it to be feasible. Uh, it is not operational yet. It's not, it's, it's not been put into practice. But I think the transmission companies uh, with the retailers or wholesalers, they have to be in contact. 
and I think they can bring these types of contracts to the banks. Once we have these contracts, then there are two main things that we consider. Who is the party to the contract? I mean, at the energy purchase side, who is providing for the guarantee? A credible party or not? Well, is there any possibility that they will decide not to purchase electricity? And the other thing is about the termination articles. The prices have increased, let's assume, and the contract is terminated, or vice versa. It can depend on the type of the contract, but what are the clauses in the contract that protects uh, the party that we are financing? You asked about the price, I know, but not possible for me to say if the price is at this level, then I will provide financing. You know, there are several other parameters, interest rate, uh, the amount of energy that company uh, will be producing, about their EBITDA, or these types of factors that we will have. Therefore, I mean, I cannot say if it is five cents, then I will finance. I can say that. Uh, but of course, a constant price or fixed price, or at least maybe there's an indexing, an index price that we can rely on. Uh, having a strong off taker, and also the termination articles must be uh, strong. That is what the foreign banks are doing because the foreign banks receive these types of contracts. We're not going to do the contracts at the end of the day. It is not our task. I mean, it's not like being in the PPA market or improve the PPA market. This is not our task. We know the players in the market, the generators, wholesalers, retailers, and so on. They're all defined. They can set the mechanism, and the banks will finance it. I think that's where the market should evolve, as we discussed, especially physical delivery in the long run. When we have this energy market, I guess there will be more corporate PPAs. Uh, a notoriety was given to a Piash, and a Piash is now working on this. And I don't know, maybe next year, probably next year, right? Once it is introduced next year, then I guess we'll have PPA mechanisms. Two more questions we can get, if any, but we should finish in five minutes. If there are no questions, I can ask a question to Emre. I know uh, we don't have time about uh, this, but there are several projects at the end of life in Europe. For example, the 25-year life cycle is now extended, 30, 35 years. They extend even longer for over one megawatt. And for example, we have uh, the, it is 41 years old, the oldest wind power plant. And uh, they other uh, wind power plants received a 40 year certificate for extension of the life cycle, 30, 35 years. Do you think mm, they will affect positively the project financing, or do you think it is going to be possible to have different models, Mr. Hatem? Yes, uh, it might because the year long is quite long. I mean, it is 12 years, the maximum 12 years, but you can go up to 14, 15 years. 35 years. I mean, it's not possible for us to have a due date of 35 years. We don't have such a source, such a financing. 18 years maximum, maybe 20 years in very special cases. I don't know, maybe finding some sources from abroad, different uh, funding opportunities at YEC then. Uh, the purchasing guarantee is 10 years. We go over 10 years. I mean, we take the risk after 10 years, 12 years, 14 years. I mean, in the last two to four years, we get the market risk. Majority of the credit is already paid at the first 10 years, so not a big deal. Uh, if YEC then is increased up to 15 years, uh, yes, why not? 14, 15 years we can provide. I mean, we can extend it a little bit more. We do not prefer it right now, but of course, why not? Over 20 years in Europe, 30 years, I mean, not possible in Turkey, I guess. Okay, thank you very much for attending this session. Also for the panelists, thank you very much for sharing your experiences with us. 
So the next session will start at four o'clock. Thank you.